Thank you very much. Hi, everybody. My name is Jean-Philippe Chaput, and it's my great pleasure to be with you today uh, in order to talk about the benefits of having a good night's sleep for uh, the prevention of weight gain and also for the treatment of obesity. So I will concentrate my talk today more on the link between sleep and body weight because we are at the Canadian Obesity Summit, and I can talk about many other endpoints, but I will do that with uh, sleep and body weight today. So if I have to answer the title of my talk today, the answer will, will be yes. So if you want to nap during my presentation, you can, you can do that. It will be just healthy for you. So go, go ahead. So I just want to say that I have uh, no conflict of interest, and I sleep very well. So as you know, the prevalence of obesity has increased over the past years. I will not spend 10 minutes on, on this. So this is well known in Canada, US, many other countries. But uh, there was an inverse trend with regard to sleep durations. So we're getting more and more fat or more and more overweight or obese. And at the same time, we sleep less. So we, you have your data from the National Sleep Foundation in the US. So a decrease of one to two hours of sleep per day over the past 40 years in the US adult population. So you have here the proportion of young adults sleeping less than seven hours per night. So that was 15.6% uh, in 1960 and 37% in 2001. So there is this inverse trend between uh, body weight and sleep, and that was a starting point of the short sleep obesity connection. There are also some data, recent data published in 2002 12 by my colleague Tim Olds in Australia in kids and teenagers with a large number of, of uh, children from 20 countries uh, from 1905 to 2008 and they observe a decrease of more than one hour of sleep over the last 100 years. So this is true in adults and also in kids and teenagers as well. But why we sleep less today compared to a couple of years or decades ago? Apart from sleep problems such as sleep apnea and insomnia, I will say it's mainly explained by our modern way of living. So it becomes very easy for people nowadays to just cut on their sleeping time uh, for different reasons. And also a lot of people believe that sleep is a waste of time. So uh, as you will see in my next slide, uh, sleep is should be included in the, in the package for good health and a good night's sleep is very important. So it can be different reasons. You have here the advent of the bulb lights. We just have more artificial light everywhere and this has an impact on our sleep patterns. And there are recent studies showing that also the lights, the artificial light coming from your iPad, iPhone, laptops before going to bed impacts your sleep quality even though you don't feel it. So impact on melatonin levels and can impact sleep quality. Uh, it can be late night television watching, it can be uh, gadgets in the bedroom, energy drinks, caffeine, internet, uh, you work too much, or, uh, and, and so on. So there are many reasons that can explain sleep loss, and those reasons are also different between people. So it's not one recipe that applies to everybody, but the reasons are very different. In 2004, there was this uh, study published by the group of Tahiri and co-workers uh, showing uh, this U-shaped association between uh, body mass index on the y-axis and uh, sleep duration on the x-axis. So uh, with an optimal sleeping time of 7.7 .7 hours per night for the better regulation of body weight, so both short sleepers and long sleepers had a higher body mass index after adjustment for age and sex here. So the same authors found that short sleepers were characterized by lower latin levels and higher ghrelin levels. So that can be one explanation uh, of this link between short sleep duration and body weight. So because we feel more hungry with this upregulation of ap appetite stimulating hormones, so we can eat more and potentially gain weight over time. In 2006, we were one of the first ones to report the association between short sleep and overweight and obesity in kids. Here, kids involved in the Quebec Enfant Project, a large cohort of kids in the province of Quebec in, in Canada. And when we pulled together all the risk factors for overweight and obesity in this cohort of kids, we observed that uh, the winner or the loser of risk factor was short sleep duration with another ratio of 3.45, meaning roughly that uh, short sleepers were 3.5 times more at risk of being overweight or obese compared to average and long sleepers. So after short sleep, we had well-known risk factors for overweight and obesity in kids like parental obesity, television watching, low socioeconomic status, and physical inactivity. After adjustment for many covariates. So we were quite amazed by those results. So we did a subsequent study in adults involved in the Quebec family study with my colleague, uh, Andrew Tremblay, Claude Bouchard, and uh, Jean-Pierre Desprez. And again, we observed that the winner 
of risk factors or the loser was short sleep duration with another ratio of 3.8 years. So those sleeping less than six hours per night were uh, 3.8 times more at risk of being overweight or obese compared to those sleeping the good zone in adults between seven to eight hours per night. So short sleep was followed here by a high disinhibition eating behavior as assessed with the three-factor eating questionnaire. So if you're wondering what is a high disinhibition eating behavior, it is overeating in response to external cues. So if you overeat or if you drink too much when you go to the restaurant with friends, walking at, watching a good hockey game, watching your Canucks, for instance, it's probably because you have a high disinhibition eating behavior. The third one was low calcium intake, so there are growing body of evidence linking low calcium or low dairy intake with body weight uh, for different reasons. We know that calcium binds to some fatty acids in the gastrointestinal tract, and there is an increase in fecal fat expression, so more energy loss in our stools, and there's a facilitation of appetite control for those having a high calcium intake. And after that, we had what I call the big two factors here, a high-fat diet and the absence of high-intensity physical activity or the, abs the absence of vigorous physical activity. What is interesting here, the first three risk factors for overweight and obesity in, in adults do not have any caloric values per se, so no calories associated with calcium, with disinhibited eating, or with sleep, but they rather untrain or produce a mismatch between energy input and energy output to create this positive energy balance underlying obesity. So meaning that we need to address the root causes of the problem, the main reasons behind that, and for some short sleepers, overeating and lack of exercise can be symptoms of this. Uh, there was a meta-analysis published in 2008 uh, on short sleep duration and obesity in kids and adults, so the conclusions with a large number of participants. Adults sleeping less than five hours per night are 55% uh, more likely to be obese than those sleeping uh, more than five hours per night, and kids sleeping less than 10 hours per night are 89% more likely uh, to be obese than those sleeping uh, more than 10 hours per night. So it seems that the connection between short sleep and obesity is stronger in kids than adults, and it almost doesn't exist in elders. So, uh, so it seems that, yeah, short sleep is a stressor for our metabolism, and because kids are growing, their, their sleep needs are higher, so it might be worse uh, to cut on sleeping time for kids and teenagers than adults. So I was talking about cross-sectional studies, so now I will talk about uh, prospective cohort studies. I will just show one here uh, that we did uh, a couple of years ago. So you have weight gain on the y-axis. The short sleepers are those uh, sleeping less than six hours per night. In the middle, average sleepers seven to eight, and the long sleepers on the right, uh, more than nine hours per night. So again, you see this U-shape association between uh, sleep duration and body weight gain with both short sleepers and long sleepers gaining more weight over time. That, that was a six-year flow period here uh, after adjustment for many covariates, age, sex, uh, baseline body mass index, socioeconomic status, and so on. But it seems that the reasons that the two peaks doesn't mean the same thing. So the reason that can explain why short sleep leads to weight gain versus long sleep to weight gain are different. So in studies where sleep is directly objectively measured, uh, it seems that's mainly only short sleep that leads to poor health outcomes. And uh, long sleep is rather associated with other health problems. So there are other confounding factors that can explain this. And I think there is no risk of sleeping too much for your health, but it's more the lack of sleep that is bad for you. So studies are showing overall, uh, again, mainly using self-reported sleep duration. This is a limitation, of course, U-shape association between sleep duration and not only obesity, but type 2 diabetes, coronary heart disease, hypertension, and premature death, with an optimal sleeping time of seven to eight hours in adults for uh, the prevention of those chronic diseases. What about experimental studies, so intervention studies where we restrict sleep duration uh, on people and see what, what happens? So I think the best evidence comes from the group of Eve and Carter in Chicago, where they showed, for example, after two nights of four hours in bed in a crossover uh, design versus two nights of eight hours in bed. So after four hours, it was associated with a uh, decrease in leptin levels, an increase in the appetite limiting hormone ghrelin, an increase in the stress hormone cortisol, an increase in the sympathetic nervous system activity. So again, short sleep being a stressor for our body. An increase in hunger and appetite, and especially for calorie-dense foods, and a direct effect on glucose homeostasis, a, a decrease in glucose tolerance. And there are other uh, more recent studies showing that uh, 
when you restrict sleep to people, like this one from Laurent Brondel in France, showing that uh, four hours in bed versus eight hours in bed. So after four hours, the participants ate 500 calories more the day after compared to eight hours. So there is a significant increase in food intake when we sleep less. Uh, this one published again by uh, the group in, in Chicago in the U.S. after uh, not two days but two weeks of uh, restriction of sleep in a sleep lab with ad libitum access to palatable food and less severe restriction of sleep, not four hours but 5.5 versus 8.5 in a crossover design. And uh, they observed more snacking after short sleep versus uh, normal or long sleep. So, and it's probably because when you're awake for a longer period of time, you just have more time and more opportunities for eating. So it's just normal when you're exposed to this food offer that uh, some short sleepers are not able to resist. Uh, there are some recent need studies published, uh, one by my colleague Marie-Pierre Saint-Onge in New York and uh, also one by Christian Benedict in Sweden uh, using fMRI uh, data, so to show looking at the, at the brain activation of areas in the brain associated with food reward and also desire to eat. So it seems that uh, after restriction of sleep, uh, there is this uh, increased desire to eat, this drive to eat. And also uh, it fits well with our study that we published last year uh, with my uh, PhD student, uh, Jess McNeil, uh, showing that short sleepers drink more alcohol than long sleepers. So again, with this rewarding aspect of food, uh, it can fit well with short sleep. So I hope that you sleep well and you don't drink too much here in, in Vancouver during this meeting. Uh, to follow up on this uh, rewarding value of food as a result of uh, short sleep, so we also published those results uh, looking at uh, disinhibition eating behavior. So it's not all short sleepers who eat more and gain weight. So we wanted to characterize a bit more our group of short sleepers. So you have here on the left short sleepers less than six hours per night. In the middle, average sleepers seven to eight. On the right, the long sleepers more than nine. But if you look at the short sleepers on the left here, uh, you have uh, with this black bar, short sleepers having a high disinhibition eating behavior. Again, as assessed with the three-factor eating questionnaire, so which is overeating in response to external cues. They gain much more weight over time, over six years, compared to the short sleepers not having a high disinhibition eating behavior. So again, it's not all short sleepers who eat more and gain weight, but if you have, if you have short sleep plus a high disinhibition eating behavior, you're more likely, more prone to gain weight over time. And they also eat more. So the short sleepers having a high disinhibition eating behavior score, uh, they also eat more compared to the short sleepers not having a high disinhibition eating behavior score. On the other side of the energy balance equation, not energy in, but energy out. So it seems that lack of sleep can also impact physical activity participation. And those results show that there is a decrease in high intensity physical activity or vigorous physical activity as a result of uh, restriction of sleep. We, we published a review paper last year to, to discuss the mechanisms behind short sleep and uh, energy balance. And our conclusion was this one. So at present, it appears very likely that uh, insufficient sleep, so short sleep duration, but also poor sleep quality, two different things, uh, but they, they also show the same, the same results. Results in increased food intake, that is pretty clear in, in most studies, but there is little support that it results in reduced energy expenditure. So we looked at all the components of energy expenditure, resting, metabolic rate, uh, thermic effect of food, non-exercise activity, thermogenesis, and, and so on but only the physical activity component, there was an, an effect, but some people move less as a result of lack of sleep because they feel more tired and less likely to, to go to the gym, for example. But some people move more as a result of lack of sleep. So it seems there's a large inter and, and individual variation as a response to lack of sleep with regard to physical activity. But the food intake part is pretty clear that people eat more as a result of lack of sleep. So if I wrap up the mechanism that can explain why lack of sleep, so poor sleep quality and short sleep duration can lead to body weight gain over time or obesity. So uh, lack of sleep can increase food intake via uh, this homeostatic feeding behavior, the hormones that trigger hunger. So with an upregulation of appetite stimulating hormones, so increase in ghrelin, for example, decrease in leptin, increase in cortisol levels, we feel more hungry, so we might eat more. 
but also uh, lack of sleep can increase food intake via the non-homeostatic feeding behavior or this eating in the absence of hunger. Just the fact that, for example, if you sleep four hours per night, you will be exposed to the current obesogenic environment for 20 hours. We have more time and more opportunities for eating. And in fact, when I look at the recent studies, it seems that the key piece here between lack of sleep and weight gain is really more the non-homeostatic feeding behavior and the fact that we're in front of this highly potable energy-dense foods and uh, that some short sleepers are not able to resist. On the other side of the energy balance equation, energy expenditure, I told you some short sleepers uh, feel more tired, so with this increased fatigue, you're less likely to exercise, to move, so it can impact energy expenditure. And altogether, lack of sleep seems to promote this positive caloric balance underlying obesity and can lead to weight gain over time. So lack of sleep and weight gain, what is the contribution of the stress system? Uh, we published two papers, one in kids, one in adults, uh, showing that uh, with lack of sleep or short sleep duration, there is a preferential uh, increase in abdominal adiposity over general or... Uh, so people gain more weight in the abdomen, and GP was talking last, last night about uh, this bad fat, visceral fat. So if it is true that short sleepers gain more weight here as opposed to general obesity, this is not good news. And some of the mechanisms that can explain that, so I told you that lack of sleep is a stressor for our body. So with this increased cortisol levels has been shown to promote the deposition of fat in, in the abdomen, uh, maybe blunting of growth hormone and so on. So we don't know quite yet the mechanisms behind that, but it seems that there is a preferential deposition of fat in the abdomen as a result of lack of sleep. Uh, we published a piece last year in CMAJ uh, to talk about having a good night's sleep to improve the treatment of obesity. So I was talking about the prevention of weight gain, but what about weight loss now? So and, uh, addressing sleep for weight management has been endorsed by the Canadian Obesity Network as well, and there are five A's of obesity management with lack of time. And uh, so I think the best evidence that we have so far is this paper published in 2010 in the Annals of Internal Medicine, a crossover study from the group in Chicago. The conclusion is, in fact, in their title, insufficient sleep undermines dietary efforts to reduce adiposity. So meaning that uh, for the same caloric rest restriction, a short sleeper can expect to lose less body fat than a good sleeper. So meaning that it's important to ask questions about sleep patterns, sleep quality, sleep quantity, when we prescribe a hypocaloric diet because it can impact the success of our weight loss program. So not just looking at food and physical activity is not enough. So I think uh, by not having a good night's sleep, it can impact the success of our weight loss interventions. So that was an intervention study. We did an observational study here on the y-axis. You have fat loss in kilogram directly measured. On the x-axis, you have sleep duration. You, have, you can see this uh, significant positive correlation. Uh, the more you sleep, the more you lose. So uh, good sleeping habits predict the magnitude of fat loss in adults exposed to caloric restriction. A good night's sleep for preventing weight gain. So uh, what we did, that was a six-year follow-up period. You have uh, here uh, weight gain on the, the y-axis and the three sleep duration groups. So the, short, the, the control group on the left side, those sleeping between seven to eight hours per night. In the middle, the short sleepers sleeping less than six hours per night who changed their sleeping habits from less than six to seven to eight. And on the right-hand side, you have the chronic short sleepers, less than six, who maintain their bad sleeping habits over time. You can see that the chronic short sleepers gain more uh, weight over time, about four kilos, but you can see no significant differences between the control group, seven to eight hours, and the short sleepers who change their bad sleeping habits into good ones. So for me, it's good, it's good, good news. It gives hope to obese short sleepers. First, you can change bad sleeping habits, and secondly, to have a positive impact on your body fat gain over time. You can limit the amount of fat that you gain over time, over the six-year for a period. So short sleep duration uh, as a cause of obesity, myth or reality, I think the proof of concept in this field of investigation will never be complete. So the, the gold standard will be to conduct a randomized controlled trial where we will restrict sleep duration in a, in a group of people 
versus like a control group where we follow them over time, over six months, one year. So it will never happen due to ethical reason and logistic reasons. So we need to rely on the available evidence or so the short-term intervention studies, the prospective court studies, and so on. So altogether, it seems that the preponderance of the evidence points toward uh, an effect of insufficient sleep, short sleep duration, and poor sleep quality on the risk to gain weight. So I think that there is minimal risk in taking a pragmatic approach and encouraging a good night's sleep as an adjunct to other health promotion measures. So we talk a lot about the big two factors in obesity prevention and the treatment of obesity, so unhealthy diet and lack of physical activity. So should we talk about the big three? So include sleep as well. So I think there are many other factors as well that can impact energy in, energy out, this energy balance equation. But sleep seems to be a promising important factor to consider. We sleep one third of our lives. It seems to be important in the package for good health. And many people believe in this modern way of living that just cutting on our sleeping time, it's okay, it's not harmful, but over time it can be harmful on many levels. I was just talking about weight gain, but there are many other things as well. So I think uh, in the prevention of obesity and the treatment, sleep should be considered, it can be an important confounder in your associations as well. So I think it should be taken into account and we should talk more about the benefits of having a good night's sleep uh, and, just, and not just saying that it is a waste of time. So if you're uh, wondering about the sleep guidelines, uh, you can go on the website of the National Sleep Foundation. You will see that uh, school-age kids need a minimum of 10 hours of sleep per night, adults, elders between seven to nine. So of course, the sleep needs are very different between people. Some people feel fresh after six hours, others need nine. Because of our, our genes, we're all different. But this is just a guide from a population level standpoint. Uh, but at the moment, with my colleague Mark Tremblay, with the CON, with the Canadian Sleep Society, we would like to uh, come up with a Canadian sleep guide. So we have the Canadian food guide, the Canadian physical activity guidelines, but there is no Canadian sleep guide. And uh, in fact, this, those guidelines in the US are not evidence informed. So what we want to do, we want to follow this strict, this robust process that Mark used for the physical activity guidelines to come up with many, uh, to review all the evidence with many endpoints because health is just, it's more than cardio metabolic health and to come up with good uh, ranges of sleep uh, for people, for Canadians. So that will be probably the first in the world uh, evidence informed sleep uh, guide that will hopefully come up in, a, in the next future. So thank you very much for your attention. And if you have any questions, I'll be pleased to answer your questions. That's a good point. And I did my postdoc in Copenhagen in Denmark in 2008, 2010, and uh, it's more north. So during summertime, there's more light. During wintertime, uh, more people are depressed because it's dark. And uh, so I, f I felt that as well. And this, this is true. And you can even go more north, and there will, there will be almost no, no light. So I think we need to adapt our, if we come up with guidelines, it will be uh, different between different parts of Canada, for example. Uh, I think there is no magic solution for that, but we just need to adapt where we live at and to adjust our, I think the best way to know like how much sleep I need, because it's different between people, is really to wake up without alarm clock. So spontaneously, you just pick one day in, in your week. So at first, if you need one alarm clock, it's because you're sleep deprived, so you're not supposed to use that, but we all use that. Uh, but at least for me, I need maybe 7.5 hours, I know, but can be different between people. So. We, I think it's difficult to come up with one magic number for everybody because it can be so different, but uh, it, it will be a range. But for uh, uh, during winter time or summertime for different regions in Canada, Northern, Southern, uh, I think it will change depending on the month of the year. And uh, so might need more sleep at some point, less at some point. So it will change. So it's not static, but more 
that it will change over time. Uh, she was asking about maternal weight gain, so the, the sleeping habits of the mom, and what happens to the baby during pregnancy. And that's a good point, and the answer is no, we don't know about that. And my colleague, Christy Adamo, works a lot on this topic, and uh, Zach Ferraro is trying to uh, write a, a paper at the moment, look at the evidence on this field and there's almost nothing so we don't know about that and I think we'll need studies to know the impact of this because uh, we really don't know but that's a good point. Um, the other two people should have had a, 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 a one of these because we couldn't hear the question. Anyway my question is what about the perimenopausal or menopausal woman with their hot flashes which I wouldn't have believed happened until I hit that time of life and I didn't realize it was as bad as it truly is. And they have awakenings um, sometimes two to three or four times a night. Each of them are lasting 15 to 20 minutes. And so they might be in bed the right number of hours, but they're having a very drastically interrupted sleep pattern. So what do we do about those people? Excellent question again. Uh, this is true that uh, the sleep quality decreases with age. So uh, the sleep needs are supposed to stay the same, but you can spend nine hours or 10 hours in your bed by just getting five hours of good night's sleep. So sleep quality is as important as quantity. Uh, what we do with those women, uh, I think it's a good question. My, the advice I like to give to people, are you physically active every day at least 30 minutes? I know that by being active, it really improves our sleep quality. That's one thing. And I think that most people are not active enough. We, when we see data in kids, adults, everybody doesn't move enough. Uh, that can be one thing. And uh, so I don't like to propose sleeping pills and those things because we try to fix something with uh, so I think by being active, uh, really trying to have a good, uh, active, healthy lifestyle, it's probably the best advice I will give to those women. Uh, and uh, yeah, so there is no magic answer to this for sure. Hi, thanks for that talk, that was great. It's Jill Hamilton from Sick Kids. Um, as a pediatrician, we see altered circadian rhythms in adolescents in particular with um, basically their biology wanting to go to bed very, very, very late and then sleep in quite late. And um, in our obesity clinic, it seems even much more pronounced in terms of the impact on light. Have you looked at not just duration, but the, the sort of rhythm, circadian rhythm of sleep and how that impacts? Yes. And there are a couple of studies coming out right now about sleep timing. So not just quality, quantity, but timing. It seems that for the same sleep duration, if you go to bed late and you wake up late versus going to bed early and wake up early, Going to bed late is worse for the same amount of sleep. For different reasons, we know that it is associated with uh, screen time, late evenings, and there is more snacking, uh, energy intake as well, so when we look at caloric intake. And people are more overweight obese when they go to bed late and wake up late on a population level. There are other things to look at, but it seems to be better. Uh, but it's different between people. I like to go, I like to wake up late. I'm not that early morning type of person, so we're all different. But when we look at studies, what they are telling us at the moment, so independent of sleep duration, sleep timing has an impact on many health outcomes. But we're just starting to learn about uh, the, those, uh, those things about sleep timing. Good point. So thank you very much. Uh